morning and welcome to our message today, which is the fourth in our series, The Acts of the Holy Spirit. And the particular emphasis here is on spiritual gifts, spiritual gifts. And the fourth message is entitled, Your, Gif your Gifts Are Not For Your Benefit. Your gifts are not for your benefit. And we're going to look today at a particular principle relating to church life, and that is the priority of edification. Edification, building each other up. Now we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 from verses 1 all the way through to verse 25. But I'm not going to read the whole passage to start with. I'm going to read the first few verses and the last few verses. So you can get a grasp of what the passage is about. And then we're going to go through the chapter verse by verse. The message might be a little different today to follow. Because I'm just going to be reading from the passage and making some points as we go along. So I'm grateful to Barry who puts in the verses and uh, the points. So that you can follow along wherever you are. So let's read together the first three verses. And then the last three verses of this particular passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. We read there, Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. That's the first three verses. Now we're going to read from verse 23 to verse 25. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues, and some who do not understand or some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everybody is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he, that he is a sinner and will be judged by all. And the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. So he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. May God bless the reading of his word today. Now, people all over the world are searching for significance. This drive for significance is so strong that people will even do terrible things if they see that this is the only way they will ever leave a mark on history. Even Christians fall into the trap of feeling like their lives don't count, that they are not important. But Christians of all people, or to understand just how significant they are. Because it is impossible to read the Bible and fail to see just how much value God places on every life. We've been studying just how important you are to God and to the body of Christ, His church. In chapter 12, we discovered that each person has been given a spiritual gift and that the spiritual gifts are given for the common good. In other words, the gifts are not for you. They're given for the benefit of all. Then in chapter 13, we saw how without love, none of what we do really amounts to much in God's eyes. Love makes it all work. Without love, you may do great and mighty things and people may be impressed, but God is not. So we see that the gifts of the Spirit and love go together. And Paul begins this chapter with these words, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. We will see that the priority of edification in worship is what should motivate our use of gifts. The gifts are not for you, they are for those around you, that through their use in love, others may be encouraged and edified, built up. So we read, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. That's verse 1. 
We are told to desire all the gifts, but that there is one gift we should desire more than all the rest. We should desire especially the gift of prophecy. Now in the church at Corinth, there was a significant controversy over their practice of the gifts of the Spirit. Some of them had made a big deal over the gift of tongues. Even today, some may make more of this gift than the Scripture warrants. Now to be fair, I might also say that there are some who discount this gift altogether, and they are equally guilty of making less of this gift than the Scripture warrants. Tongues has a place among Christians and even in the church. The question concerns what place it should have. Perhaps it would help us to look at the definition of the spiritual gift of tongues. The gift of tongues is the ability of speaking a divine utterance, unintelligible to both the speaker and the hearer. So we could ask the question, is this a language? Some would say it is. It certainly could be. In chapter 13, Paul mentions speaking in the tongues of men or angels. Now obviously there are hundreds of different languages and dialects among humans. Without taking into account angelic languages. On the day of Pentecost, people from various nations heard the disciples speaking in their own languages. Was this because they were actually speaking in the language? Or was the miracle in the fact that the hearer was enabled to understand what they were saying in his own language? Either interpretation would seem to fit. But the point is that tongues is divine communication to God and that it must be accompanied by the companion gift of the interpretation of tongues in a group setting. Now prophecy, on the other hand, is a foretelling of a now word from God. It is not merely preaching, although I would argue that there's a prophetic element in preaching, at least in anointed preaching. So why does Paul say that we should especially desire the gift of prophecy? Verse 2 says, For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. Tongues are directed to God. It's clear from the text. He does not speak to men, but to God. He goes on to say that no one understands him. As he speaks in this unintelligible manner, he utters mysteries with his spirit. Now we can conclude that the direction of tongues is to God, not to those assembled in the meeting. This is even consistent with what we hear reported on the day of Pentecost. Those listening said they heard the disciples glorifying and praising God. Even the tongues manifested that day were in the form of prayer and praise. We read on that, But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. That's verses 3 and 4. So the reason we should desire to prophesy is that it speaks to men. In other words, the one who prophesies is speaking in the known language of the people who have gathered, and there's no need for the companion gift of interpretation. Three benefits of prophecy are mentioned there. Strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. Prophecy has a powerful potential to edify or build up all the people present. Now tongues can edify as well, but we are told that the one thing that gift edifies himself only. Whereas the one exercising the gift of prophecy edifies the church, not just himself. Now it might be said that there is some value in personal edification. But the point he's making 
is that there's more value in corporate edification. So we read on. Paul says, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may be edified. Verse 5. The spiritual gift of tongues is great. Paul personally wished that everyone could speak in tongues, but he had a greater desire for them to prophesy. Why? Because the value lies in how many people were being edified or built up in their faith. And so we read on. Now, brothers, if I come to you, speak in tongues, what good will I be to you? Unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction. That's verse 6. The case that Paul is building here is that in the church, the goal is bringing as much understanding to as many people as possible. Unless people received some revelation, knowledge, prophecy or word of instruction in a language they could understand, what good would it be to them? None. Paul gives them an illustration. We read on. Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds, such as a flute or harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? That's verses 7 and 8. Have you ever heard an orchestra preparing to play? As they are tuning up their instruments, what you hear is a cacophony of conflicting sounds. It's anything but harmonious music. Each individual is focusing on his or her instrument, making sure that it is functioning properly and that they are warmed up and ready to play. But when the conductor calls them to attention, and they begin to play. Then they come together in a wonderful symphony of music that everyone can enjoy. Similarly, soldiers in the battle will have no idea what to do if the one who is responsible to sound the trumpet does not do so with precision. You see, the trumpet signaled when to charge and when to retreat. You didn't want to get those signals mixed up. So again, the point is being made. Everyone needs to understand what is being communicated. So we read on. So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you're saying? You will just be speaking into the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world. Yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker, and he is a foreigner to me. So it is with you. Since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in gifts that build up the church. For this reason, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. That's verses 9 to 14. You see, the gift of tongues is never to be alone. It's to be accompanied by the gift of interpretation so that everyone may benefit from what is being said. Languages have meaning. But if you don't speak the language, you don't know what it means. If you pray in a tongue and there is no interpretation of that prayer, you may be blessed in that your spirit prays even though your mind is unfruitful, not knowing what you have said. But the problem is that no one else knows what you have said in that prayer either. So Paul says, so what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit. But I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. If you are praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those 
who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving since he does not know what you're saying. You may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. I thank God, Paul says, that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. That's verses 15 to 19. So the correction to the problem was a simple one. Make sure you do not abuse this gift. The clear emphasis is that in the church, intelligible words should be used. Paul said that he spoke in tongues more than all of them. That is an incredible statement, especially since he was speaking to the church in Corinth. If Paul would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue, when did he do all of this tongue speaking? The obvious answer is that he did it in private prayer. That is one place where there's no need for the gift of interpretation. But in the church, tongues must be interpreted. Paul goes on. Brothers, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants. But in your thinking, be adults. In the law it is written, through men of strange tongues and through the lips of foreigners I will speak to this people. But even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues then are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers, not for unbelievers. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues, and some who do not understand or some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everybody is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all, and the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. So he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. That's verses 20 to 25. Paul reminds them here of the judgment that God brought upon his people through the Assyrians. The Old Testament scripture he refers to had to do with the strange tongues the foreign invading army spoke. Those who refused to trust God, the unbelievers, were literally spoken to by the foreign army. It was a sign of God's judgment. Now when we gather together as a church, if everyone is speaking in tongues, the very people we're trying to reach are going to conclude that we're crazy because they don't understand. On the other hand, through words that they do understand, God may speak to them in a powerful way. Many of you can testify how you felt that the preacher was speaking directly to you. It was as if he knew all of your secret sins. There may come a prophetic word that actually identifies something in a person's life that will bring conviction and repentance. We must remember that we are not here or that we are here not for ourselves, but for others. We have been redeemed from the powers of darkness. We have been translated into the kingdom of light. We have been given the key to that kingdom. The gospel message that has the power to set people free. Yet the church often gets caught up in peripheral issues when we should be majoring in the majors. Friends, God is God and we can't put him into a box. Often, people who propose that we follow the scripture or people who do propose that we follow the scripture on the issue of the gifts of the Spirit are accused of trying to put God in a box. And that charge is untrue. God wrote the scriptures. He gave them to us so that we could follow them. And to do so is not to put him in a box. It is to unleash the power of the Holy Spirit to work in our midst. So let's be reminded as we close. God has given every Christian 
at least one gift. And he expects you to use that gift, not simply to bless yourself, but to bless others and to build them up in their faith. The gifts are not for you. They are to be used to edify, to build up one another in the body of Christ. May God build us up as we touch our lives against each other in the fellowship of the church. And may the glory go to God, who is the giver of the gifts. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you gave us the greatest gift of all. Your Son, the Lord Jesus. And through that gift, we have been redeemed and reconciled to be the children of God. We thank you that you've not left us alone as your children to struggle on in this world. You've given to us the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit that we may be encouraged by each other along the way to follow you. Now, Lord, in the church, may all the glory go to you. May the love of God the grace of the Lord Jesus and the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit be with us and keep us now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. I look forward to seeing you soon. I look forward to what God is going to do in our church through us by the Holy Spirit in building us up in our faith. Until then, goodbye.